welcome to episode one of Philosophical Reactions, where we will be taking an in-depth look at issue number one of Philosophical Transactions for Monday, March 6, 1664-5. No, that isn't a typo. The date really was listed as 1664-5. Traditionally, the new year in England started on March 25th. That was the Feast of the Annunciation, known as Lady Day in England. This officially changed when they finally adopted the Gregorian calendar in 1752, but already by the late 1600s things were starting to change. Most of their neighbors had switched long ago, including Scotland in 1600. Due to the potential confusion in the January 1st through March 24 period, dates were often written down as X slash X plus 1, just to make clear which March 6 you were talking about. A remnant of this still persists in the UK, with a tax year ending on April 5th. This is Old Lady Day, that is, March 25th, in the Julian calendar. Introduction My prose is no match for Henry Oldenburg, so I'll just let him have his say. Whereas there is nothing more necessary for promoting the improvement of philosophical matters than the communicating to such as apply their studies and endeavors that way, such things as are discovered or put in practice by others, it is therefore thought fit to employ the press as the most proper way to gratify those whose engagement in such studies, and delight in the advancement of learning and profitable discoveries, doth entitle them to the knowledge of what this kingdom, or other parts of the world do, from time to time afford, as well as of the progress of the studies, labors, and attempts of the curious, and learned in things of this kind, as of their complete discoveries and performances. To the end that such productions being clearly and truly communicated, desires after solid and useful knowledge may be further entertained, ingenious endeavors and undertakings cherished, and those, addicted to and conversant in such matters, may be invited and encouraged to search, try, and find out new things, impart their knowledge to one another, and contribute what they can to the grand design of improving natural knowledge, and perfecting all philosophical arts and sciences, all for the glory of God, the honor advantage of these kingdoms, and the universal good of mankind. An account of the improvement of optic glasses. This is an account by way of Paris of Giuseppe Campani's Waguaglio di due nuove observazioni, published in Rome the previous year. Mold in this case probably refers to the pre-shaped laps used in lens production of the day, not molds for the casting of lens blanks. More interestingly, it describes certain protuberances and inequalities on Jupiter that seem to indicate the planet is rotating, which, in his opinion, would serve much to confirm the opinion of Copernicus. More on this later. The next article, appropriately enough, is the first recorded observation of the great red spot of Jupiter, from no less than Robert Hooke himself. A spot in one of the belts of Jupiter. The ingenious Mr. Hooke did, some months since, intimate to a friend of his that he had, with an excellent 12-foot telescope, observed some days before he then spoke of it, Videl on the 9th of May, 1664, about nine of the clock at night, a small spot in the biggest of the three obscure belts of Jupiter, and that observing it from time to time, he found that within two hours after, the said spot had moved from east to west, about half of the length of the diameter of Jupiter. The motion of the late comet predicted. This is from Adrian Ozu, later to criticize Hooke's promotion of a lens grinding setup he had never actually tried. Ozu predicted the path of a recent comet, and is asking for observations, either to confirm the hypothesis upon which the author had beforehand calculated the way of this star, or to undeceive him if he be in a mistake. He specifically mentions wanting reports from Madagascar and Guyana. He also wonders if, whether it may not serve to decide the grand question concerning the motion of the Earth. That makes two separate articles in this issue which reference Copernican heliocentrism as an open question. We're only 30 years after Galileo's trial, remember, and while there was no fear of the Inquisition in England, doubts as to the motion of the Earth would persist for a much longer time than most histories of science would lead you to believe. An Experimental History of Cold There is in the press a new treatise entitled New Observation and Experiments in Order to an Experimental History of Cold, begun by that noble philosopher Mr. Robert Boyle, and in great part already printed. He did lately very obligingly present several copies of so much as was printed to the Royal Society, with a desire that some of the members thereof might be engaged to peruse the book, and select out of it for trial the hints of such experiments as the author there wisheth might be either yet made or prosecuted. This is followed by a long list of experiments which involve coldness. Unless you have read Francis Bacon's New Organon, 
This is likely to seem pretty weird. But more than just an extended attack on scholastic Aristotelianism, Bacon's work was meant as the beginning of a grand new project. All aspects of nature were to be documented, and great lists of aspects of every part were to be drawn up. This isn't the scientific method as we understand it. The process Bacon describes is not at all form a hypothesis, develop an experiment to test it, run the experiment. Instead, he thinks that first of all the raw facts about the world must be gathered, and only then can philosophers look over the pile and extract new axioms from it. It's induction, but still a very centralized, ironically very Aristotelian form of induction. The new organon ends with a list of sources of heat as an example of how this would work. These include the rays of the sun, particularly in summer and at noon, ignited meteors, confined and subterraneous air in some caverns, particularly in winter, and eruptions of flames from the cavities of mountains. Bacon then uses these to make a surprisingly strong argument for heat being a form of motion, too. He never wrote the subsequent books as he imagined, but the Royal Society very much saw itself as continuing the project. An account of a very odd monstrous calf. By the same noble person was lately communicated to the Royal Society an account of a very odd monstrous birth, produced at Lymington in Hampshire, where a butcher, having caused a cow, which cast her calf the year before, to be covered that she might the sooner be fattened, killed her when fat, and opening the womb, which he found heavy to admiration, saw in it a calf, which had begun to have hair, whose hinder legs had no joints, and whose tongue was cerebus like triple, to each side of his mouth one, and one in the midst. Without a doubt, this is my favorite article. First, Monstrous Calf with the Long S's would make an excellent death metal band name. But also, it really shows how the Royal Society was making this up as they went along. The barn and ideal of the scientist hadn't been invented yet. Even the word scientist itself was still two centuries away. So you get this gloriously weird combination where Cabinet of Curiosity entries like this are printed alongside the first observation of the Great Red Spot. Of a peculiar lead ore of Germany and the use thereof. Some lead ore from Germany. The person who sent it has been asked how much is available. That's about it. Of a Hungarian bolus, of the same effect with the bolus arminus. Bolus arminus is a red clay, which was used in medicine at the time, and at times since as a pigment. For a while it was even used in certain toothpastes which left an insoluble paste behind. By staining this paste red, the buildup along the gums wasn't so obvious. Of the new American whale fishing about the Bermudas. His account, as far as remembered, was this, that though hitherto all attempts of mastering the whales of those seas had been unsuccessful, by reason of the extraordinary fierceness and swiftness of these monstrous animals, yet the enterprise being lately renewed, and such persons chosen and sent thither for the work, as were resolved not to be baffled by a sea monster, they did prosper so far in this undertaking. One but scarce credible quality of this oil, he affirms to be, that though it be boiling, yet one may run one's hand into it without scalding, to which he adds, that it hath a very healing virtue for cuttings, lameness, etc., the part affected being anointed therewith. The name of the understanding and hardy seaman this comes from is not given, but I'm just going to assume it is Ishmael. A narrative concerning the success of pendulum watches at sea for the longitudes. This was one of the great practical scientific problems of the day. It is easy enough to find latitude, how far north or south of the equator you are, at night by measuring the height off the horizon of a pole star, or during the day at noon by sighting the sun. But longitude, how far east or west of an arbitrary point you are, couldn't be done. One possible way would be to have a very accurate clock on board. Combined with a very accurate ephemerides of the stars, you could compare how high you saw a star with how high it would be seen someplace else at the same time, and use that to work out where you were. But the precision that would be needed was quite daunting. Only just recently achieved for large stationary observatory clocks, using Huygens' invention of the pendulum clock not even ten years earlier. It was natural someone would try to recreate this on board a ship, but pendulum clocks really don't work very well without a stable platform. A rocking ship with constantly changing temperature and humidity definitely doesn't count. The watch in question probably had a gimbaled mount, but that can only help so much. Presumably the success of this test was a fluke, and Huygens was right to be surprised. I did not imagine that the watches of this first structure would succeed so well and I had reserved my main hopes for the new ones. 
but seeing that those have already served so successfully, and that the other are yet more just and exact, I have the more reason to believe that the invention of longitudes will come to its perfection. This wish would come true, but not for a long time still. The character, lately published beyond the seas, of an eminent person, not long since dead at Toulouse, where he was a councillor of parliament. This is a lovely little memorial to Fermat, who was a well-known mathematician even before his last theorem was published. It is the deservedly famous Monsieur de Fermat, who was, saith the author of the letter, one of the most excellent men of this age, a genius so universal and of so vast an extent, that if very knowing and learned men had not given testimony of his extraordinary merit, what with truth can be said of him would hardly be believed. More particulars will perhaps be mentioned of the works of this rare person, when all things that he hath published shall be recovered, and when liberty shall be obtained of his worthy son, to impart unto the world the rest of his writings hitherto unpublished. And it is because of this worthy son, Clement Samuel Fermat, that we know about Fermat's last theorem at all. The original copy of Diophantus's Arithmetica, in which Fermat made his famous note, is lost, but before it disappeared, Clement Samuel printed an edition which included all of the notes his father had made. These included, of course, It is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes, or a fourth power into two fourth powers, or in general, any power higher than the second into two like powers. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. And that's it for issue number one. Tune in next month for the next episode of Philosophical Reactions for an update on the monstrous calf and a review of one of the most important works of popular science ever published.